Alexander the Great was pretty great. In 13 short years, he conquered an area of 3,000 miles, subjugating the mighty Persian, Greek, and Egyptian empires in the process. But this video isn't about him. It's about Oda Nobunaga, a guy some historians have called Japan's Alexander the Great. During the war-torn era of Sengoku, Japan, Oda Nobunaga conquered like no other, eventually uniting Japan under his rule. And he did so with a blend of ruthlessness and eccentric charisma. This is his story. Betrayal As dawn broke on June 21, 1582, Oda Nobunaga realized something wasn't right. The warlord, who had nearly all of Japan in a headlock, was at the temple of Honoji, outside Kyoto, deep within his own territory. He had come to the temple with only a small detachment of soldiers and was planning on attending a tea ceremony before heading out to help with a campaign against the Mori clan. He'd sent one of his trusted generals, Akeche Butsuhide, ahead with an army of 13,000 to help one of his allies squash the troublesome clan that was refusing to submit to his rule. But Akeche had a change of heart. For reasons we don't know, he turned against Nobunaga. Instead of marching towards the Mori clan, Akeche marched on Honoji Temple. His 13,000 men, who were oblivious to who they were fighting against, surrounded the temple. From inside the temple, Nobunaga thought there was some kind of street fight or something going on outside. A bit early for that, though, he probably thought. But when he heard the battle cries, cries he recognized, he realized the reality. Nobunaga sprang into action. He picked up his bow and arrow and started firing. He was wildly outnumbered, though. Surrounded and wounded, Nobunaga locked himself in a room of the temple. He resigned himself to his fate. Maybe he said a prayer, but he wasn't particularly religious. War was the only god he prayed to with any regularity. Nobunaga then ran himself through with a sword, a ritual act called seppuku. It is said that Nobunaga had premonitions of his own demise, dreams of death that were most likely amplified by a life of war and destruction. Warlords tend to have lots of enemies, and this was obviously true for Nobunaga. Oda the Eccentric Born in Nagoya, a wari, to the head of the powerful Oda clan, Oda Nobuhide, Oda Nobunaga had a pretty strange eccentric personality from an early age. He was nicknamed the Fool of Awari, but despite the name, he would quickly become someone you certainly didn't want to fool around with. As a child and teenager, Nobunaga was known for his unpredictable behavior. He didn't follow the strict codes of conduct that were expected of someone born in a castle. He was considered reckless and impulsive, and often did things that were seen as unbecoming of a samurai. Like a lot of rebels and weirdos throughout history, one of the ways he pushed through tradition was through fashion. Nobunaga loved wearing extravagant and strange clothing. He was often seen wearing things that were considered bizarre and unconventional for that period. He loved bright lights and bold patterns, for example. A taste that was in pretty stark contrast to the subdued and elegant styles of the Japanese nobility at the time. Later on in life, he was known for wearing Western-style clothing. Nobunaga kind of embraced the West over the course of his life, and it's said he even had a shoe collection with Japanese and Western styles that would make today's most dedicated sneakerhead salivate. Even his fashion sense translated to his armor, which was apparently decked out with all kinds of gold and stylized artwork. Nobunaga was also known to give wild speeches that would both inspire and leave his men scratching their heads at the same time. His weirdness ended up working to his benefit, though. He was willing to try anything, really, to get ahead. He had a creativity that was channeled into war, and he'd do just about anything to acquire more and more power, even if that meant taking out his own brother. Sibling Chaos In 1551, Nobunaga's father died. At the funeral, Nobunaga, the eldest son and heir, threw a fit. He was yelling and throwing incense at the altar. Now, in the aftermath of the strange scene, a lot of the Oda clan's elders were kind of skeptical about letting this madman take the reins. A power struggle ensued among the clan that would last for years. In the early years of the power struggle, a seemingly minor event occurred that would go on to have huge ramifications. A few years before, Nobunaga's father had abducted the young son of a daimyo from a rival clan and held him hostage in the Hanshoji Temple in Nogoya for three years. His name was Matsudaira Takachio. His father, the daimyo of the Matsudaire clan, had offered him up as a hostage to the Imagawa clan as a token of his loyalty. But Nobunaga's father swooped in and captured him in exchange. Shortly after Nobunaga's father died and he went all crazy at the funeral, 
the Imagawa clan attacked and laid siege to the castle of Nobunaga's older brother, Nobuhiro, who was apparently illegitimate and not fit to be the heir. Nobunaga swooped in and handled the negotiations, offering up the young hostage Takechio as part of the deal in exchange for them lifting the siege. Takechio would later change his name to Tokugawa Iyasu, the man who founded the Tokugawa shogunate that would rule Japan for 165 years, between 1603 and 1868. The hostage exchange eventually led to an alliance between Nobunaga and Iyasu that would reshape Japan. But anyway, back to the Oda clan's power struggle. Nobunaga's older brother, illegitimate brother, Nobuhiro, wasn't so grateful for Nobunaga's negotiating skills. I mean, he planned to have him taken out. The plot failed, but for whatever reason, Nobunaga chose to forgive him. The real threat was coming from his younger brother, Nobuyuki. Lots of nose in the Oda clan, don't you think? Continuing family drama eventually led to the Battle of Ino in 1555. Nobuyuki, backed by a faction of the Oda clan and helped out by the leader of the Hayashi clan, rebelled against Nobunaga. Nobunaga stood firm against the alliance, though, and won the battle. In the aftermath, Nobuyuki was captured, and it seemed certain that the younger Oda brother would meet the business end of a sword. But then, Mom intervened. The brother's mother, Dota Gozen, reportedly pleaded for Nobunaga to spare Nobuyuki's life. She was apparently a bit partial to the younger son and didn't want to see him fall to his own brother. It worked. Nobunaga spared his brother's life, at least for the time being. But Nobuyuki couldn't shake off his ambitions to be head of the clan and continued to resent his brother. He held secret meetings and plotted yet again, plotting with others who were not happy with Nobunaga's rule. In 1557, Nobunaga learned of the plot his brother was cooking up and decided he'd had enough. He faked an illness and sent for his brother, who came with their mother to Kiyosu Castle, where Nobunaga was based. Instead of meeting a bedridden Nobunaga like his brother was expecting, he met two assassins, who took him out in the dark hallways of the castle. Not much is written about the mother's reaction, but I'm pretty sure she wasn't pleased. By the following year, Nobunaga had consolidated his power and had complete control of the Oda clan. It was time to take over the rest of Japan, and for that, he needed firepower. Thankfully, the Portuguese had just recently brought over these pretty effective weapons called guns. Oda's Gunpowder In 1543, a Portuguese ship ran into some bad weather and was forced to land on the island of Tanegashima, off the southern tip of Japan. It was one of the first official contacts between the Japanese and Europeans. They had with them some weird-looking sticks. The Japanese lords of the island were curious, so the Portuguese showed them how, when you pull the little trigger on one end, there was an explosion and a little metal ball fired out at high speeds with devastating effect. The Portuguese sailed off and left a few of the muskets in Japan. Warfare on the islands was about to change in a big way. A few years later, Oda Nobunaga learned of these new weapons and his eyes lit up. He immediately saw their deadly potential and he wanted more. In 1549, he armed 500 of his warriors with matchlock muskets. It was a big way he was able to consolidate his power after the death of his father. Throughout the 1550s, he began mass producing the firearms. He hired blacksmiths and honed the manufacturing technique. He established manufacturing centers dedicated to developing artillery and ammunition and started importing something called saltpeter, a vital ingredient in gunpowder, and started making his own. Nobunaga also saw the potential of cannons. Before, they were almost exclusively used on ships by pirates and foreign navies. But Nobunaga anticipated how effective they'd be on land and started doing exactly that. The move ushered in a new era in Japanese warfare, where close quarter combat was replaced by a longer range style. A case in point in the devastating effects of Nobunaga's new gunpowder army was the Battle of Nagashino in 1575. By this point, Oda Nobunaga and Tokugawa Iyasu, that hostage that would become shogun, had teamed up in a shared quest to conquer Japan. In their way was the powerful Takeda clan, renowned for their skilled cavalry and military might. When a daimyo named Okudaira Sadumasa defected from the Takeda over to Tokugawa Iyasu, Takeda leader Katsuyori decided to lay siege to his castle. Katsuyori used gold miners to tunnel under the outer walls and then rafted his samurai across the river nearby surrounding the castle, setting up siege towers, and putting Sadamasa in a tough spot. Fearing the worst, the besieged daimyo sent out a call for help. Nobunaga and Iyasu came with a force of nearly 40,000 to relieve the siege. They set up shop across the plain near the castle, behind a small stream with steep banks that they hoped would delay the cavalry charts that the Takeda clan had been using to devastate an effect for decades. 
Nobunaga then set up a series of wooden palisades, arranged in a zigzag pattern to protect the 10,000 soldiers equipped with his Tanegashima muskets. They were set up in three ranks, which allowed them to fire continuously as the Takeda cavalry charged. The result was a complete rout of the Takeda forces. Two-thirds of their ranks fell to the blizzard of bullets pummeling into the charging men on horseback. The victory was a huge turning point in modern Japanese warfare. Weapons in Japan were there to stay. The Anti-Samurai In the middle of the 15th century, around the same time Nobunaga was beginning to mass-produce his muskets, a distinct group of revolutionaries emerged throughout the Inland Sea region of southern Japan. The Iko Iki were an unlikely group of militant Buddhist monks, peasants, also merchants and local lords. They were united by two things, really, their belief in the Jodo Shinshu sect of Buddhism and their hatred of the samurai. They thought the samurai class and the daimyo system needed to go, and over the years they quickly amassed a ton of followers and a powerful military force. Nobunaga, as a daimyo himself, saw the Iko Iki as a major threat to his plans for the unification of Japan under a centralized government. They were big on autonomy and decentralization, which were in direct opposition to the centralized feudal system he was trying to establish. Nobunaga went on a bit of a rampage against the Ikoiki, though they were certainly up to the task. The ishiyama hanganji War between Nobunaga and the Ikoiki lasted for a decade. From 1570 to 1580, the two sides fought for control of the Inland Sea region. The Ikoiki had built a series of cathedral fortresses that were considered nearly impenetrable. Their main base was the fortress of Ishiyama Hongonchi in modern-day Osaka. The fortress was guarded night and day by hundreds of warrior monks wearing robes and armed to the teeth. Now, I don't know about y'all, but that sounds kind of scary. The story goes that they could simply ring a bell and summon an additional 10,000 soldiers if needed. Buddha seemed to be providing them with all the skills they needed to be ruthless soldiers. The fortress wasn't an easy place to conquer, but Nobunaga was stubborn. He decided to build his own forts around Ishiyama Hongonji in an attempt to cut off the Ikoiki supply lines. Meanwhile, he attacked another Ikoiki stronghold. Nagashima was a fort complex on Japan's Pacific coast, near modern-day Nagoya. Like Ishiyama Hongonji, it was well fortified with warrior monks who were armed to the teeth. Over the course of three years between 1571 and 1574, Nobunaga attacked the city three times. The first two times, it didn't go so well. Attempt number one ended in an embarrassing defeat. And attempt number two was even more embarrassing when a rainstorm rendered 90% of his fancy new guns effectively useless. But like they say, third time's a chunk. Thanks in large part because of Nobunaga's growing naval fleet. Under Commander Kuki Yoshitaka, the fleet blockaded Nagashima and pummeled the walls with cannon fire. Eventually, Nobunaga's cavalry and infantry were able to break through the outer defenses and had the 20,000 inhabitants of the inner fort complex completely surrounded. They then proceeded to build wooden walls around the fort so the Ikoiki couldn't escape, and they burned the entire complex to the ground. No one survived. Pirate Rivals But Nobunaga was having a harder time with the fortress at Ishiyama Hongonchi. Despite surrounding the fortress with his own fortresses, the Ikoiki were still able to get supplies via the sea thanks mostly to their alliance with the Mori clan, which had one of the most powerful navies around, thanks in part because of their alliance with a group of pirates known as Woku. The Woku started raiding the coastlines of Japan, Korea, and China back in the 1350s. By the time Nobunaga was besieging Ishiyama Hanganji, many historians believe they were actually 70% Chinese. In any case, their naval expertise helped the Mori continue to supply the Ikoiki with everything they needed while they were surrounded on land by Nobunaga's forces. Nobunaga sat down with some engineers and had a think. They cooked up some of the largest ships Japan had ever seen up until that point. The Atakabune, as they were called, were giant warships, 100 feet long, made with thick wooden hulls, covered in iron plates, and loaded up with cannons. Nobunaga had six of them built to add to his fleet, and in 1578, he tried to blockade again. With the help of his six new super ships, again led by naval commander Kuku Yoshitaka, they basically created a floating fortress, a string of ships that the Mori couldn't pass. The Second Battle of Kizugawaguchi, as it's called, was a big win for Nobunaga. With their supply route cut off, the Ikoiki were doomed. It still took two years, but they finally flew the white flag in 1580. Nobunaga's long campaign against the warrior monks was finally finished. He'd also managed to subjugate nearly all of the other clans in Japan, save for his ally, Tokugawa Iyasu. Christian Patronage 
1571, Nobunaga set fire to an entire mountain. Unfortunately, that mountain was Mount Hiei, where a monastery complex controlled by another group of warrior monks, the Sohei, lived. Nobunaga spared no one. The entire complex and everyone inside were destroyed. Nobunaga had a thing for Buddhists, it seemed, at least those who refused to submit to his rule. In reality, the warlord spread his wrath around pretty evenly. It's said he wasn't religious at all, but he let people practice what they wanted so long as they paid him tribute and didn't try anything funny. In a similar way, Nobunaga was pragmatic with Christianity. He had experience with the Portuguese, whose guns we already know he loved. So when a Portuguese Jesuit missionary named Louis Froy met with the warlord in 1569 in Kyoto, Nobunaga was eager to please, and Christianity was his strategy for cozying up to the Westerner. He allowed Freud to build a bunch of churches around Kyoto, which I'm sure the Buddhists didn't like very much. But hey, it's nice when someone allows different types of people to coexist, even if it is mostly for economic reasons. In his writings, Freud described Nobunaga as friendly and generous and that he was the right guy to unify Japan. However, Freud and the Portuguese had more motivation. They were really looking to colonize and conquer the islands, and setting up churches and converting the Japanese to Christianity was really just the first step in doing that. Nobunaga was apparently aware of this and maintained friendly relations with them anyway. According to a document found at the Vatican, Nobunaga had a meeting with his close advisor, Toyotomi Hideyoshi. Hideyoshi told Nobunaga that he had proof that the Portuguese were planning on conquering the country, but Nobunaga apparently just shrugged him off. Maybe he was confident enough in his own military might. Maybe he liked a good gamble. Now, either way, he was willing to continue trade relations with him for the time being. Two years later, though, Nobunaga was killed by his own general, Akechi Mitsuhide. Hideyoshi would succeed him and continue his pursuit of unifying all of Japan. But he didn't like the Portuguese threat and in 1587 banished all Christians from Japan. Who knows, maybe if Nobunaga wasn't taken out, Japan could have become a Portuguese colony. Although the Japanese have been historically pretty good at keeping people from conquering them, they tossed out the Mongols twice a hundred years earlier. Oda's Ghost It's said that when Oda Nobunaga committed seppuku after being betrayed by his own general, he was more worried about what would become of his body than death itself. One of the greatest mysteries about Japan's Alexander the Great is that his body was never found. When Mitsuhide went back to look for it so he could prove that he vanquished the great warlord and legitimize his own rule, well, he couldn't find Nobunaga. It's like Nobunaga had just vanished. Some think he made sure a servant smuggled his body out of Honoji Temple after he ran himself through with his sword. Others think his body turned to ashes as the temple was set ablaze, though it would have had to be a pretty massive fire to completely burn his bones. Over the years, many people have reported strange occurrences and sightings around Honoji, with some believing that the spirit of Nobunaga haunts the place. Locals and visitors have reported feeling eerie sensations, witnessing ghostly apparitions, and hearing mysterious sounds. Maybe Nobunaga's restless spirit hung around, haunting the Japan that he took steps toward unifying, even if it was through near constant warfare. What do you think? Do you think his spirit is roaming the land of Japan? Thanks for watching. What other Japanese eras do you want to learn about? Let us know in the comments, and don't forget to like and subscribe for more nutty history.